Hi everyone, welcome back. This mini lecture will be about something called the Druda model. So the first thing we're going to think about in this course is the behavior of metals. So you know that one of the distinguishing characteristics of a metal is that it conducts electricity. We also know that electrons are the most common carrier of charge. So it's reasonable to think that electrons are responsible for the conduction of electricity in metals. So let's consider the behavior of electrons in metals. So the essence of the Druda model, which was developed by Paul Druda, is that we should think of each atom as having a nucleus, uh, a set of core electrons, and then a set of valence electrons. So the idea is to imagine an atom is having a nucleus. Here's the nucleus. It has positive charge E times uh, Z sub A. So here Z sub A is the atomic number. And E uh, is the charge of the electron. So here's the nucleus, it has a positive charge E times Z sub A. Then around this nucleus is a set of core electrons. So the charge in this set of core electrons is minus E times uh, Z sub A minus something that we'll call Z. So Z is the valence number. And then the valence electrons form a cloud of charge minus E Z around the atom. So the idea now is that this cloud of valence electrons are rather weakly bound to the positive core and they can really wander around the metal. It's the valence electrons uh, that are responsible for the conduction of electricity. Now, you might ask, where do these valence electrons come from in the first place? So that is something that the Druda model does not answer. That is an assumption of the Druda model. Uh, we'll have to wait until later when we talk about band structure to find out where do these valence electrons come from? Why are some electrons around atoms free and others not? Now in the Druda model, the idea is to imagine that uh, now some kind of extended material system really just looks like a set of positive uh, cores of atoms surrounded by core electrons. Okay, you get the idea. These are the positive cores and the valence clouds, or rather the uh, the, the core electron clouds are these. Then, again, I'm imagining that these three electrons, these three atoms are part of a larger system of atoms that form a piece of bulk material. Around all of these, I have this cloud of valence electrons. And the idea is that these valence electrons are entirely delocalized. And it's these things that mediate uh, the conduction of electricity through uh, bulk solids. So the essence now of the Druda model is to ask what happens to these valence electrons and to find the answer to that we're going to think of these valence electrons as uh, members of a classical gas of electrons. So the Druda model really is uh, a model that considers a classical gas of electrons, and we're going to see how this can explain the resistance of metals, it can explain some aspects of thermal conduction, uh, and it can even explain some things like uh, the Hall effect. Now, you might wonder how can a theory so seemingly simple as one that considers just a classical gas of electrons get anything right? Um, 
you'll see there are a variety of reasons for this. Um, it really is quite remarkable uh, that the Druda model does so well, and it is still in common use today uh, for some important things. So I'll try to highlight these applications as we go along. So the first thing that we're going to do is to define a density of electrons. So we'll use little n to mean the density of electrons. We'll define it as capital N over capital V. So here, capital N is the total number of electrons in the system. Capital V is the total volume of those electrons. We can equivalently write this as um, Z, this valence number. Remember, it's an integer. It describes how many free electrons there are per atom times rho over A. So remember, Z is the valence number. Rho is the atomic mass. Rather, excuse me, rho is the mass density of the material. And A is the atomic mass. So both of these things have units of uh, Per, per, per volume, uh, often per, per centimeters cubed. And um, uh, we'll, we'll come back again and again to use lowercase n to mean the density of electrons. By the way, while I'm thinking about it, you'll notice that Ashcroft and Merman uses uh, CGS units in the textbook. Uh, most of my notes will reflect uh, this convention as well. Uh, occasionally, I'll quote things in SI units uh, because um, perhaps like you, I think most easily in terms of SI units. But in most cases, we'll use CGS units in this course. So often the densities we'll see have units of um, inverse centimeters cubed. All right. Um, so we'll also define uh, a quantity uh, RS such that um, the, the volume per electron, which is equal to one over the density of electrons, uh, is equal to a sphere, the volume of a sphere with radius Rs. So Rs tells you the radius of a sphere whose volume is equal to uh, the volume per electron in the system. So Rs is a way to parameterize the density of electrons in the system. Uh, by rearranging the equation I just wrote down, you can see that Rs is equal to 3 over 4 pi n to the 1 third power. Typical densities in metals are of order uh, 10 to the 22 per cubic centimeter. That's uh, a very large number of electrons and typical values of Rs. Again, the radius of uh, the characteristic sphere will be of order angstroms. Uh, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters or 10 to the minus uh, 8 centimeters. So let's talk about uh, the assumptions of the Druda model. So these are worth remembering. In some sense, these assumptions will form the outline for the course for the whole term because we will start with the Druda model, which makes a number of assumptions, and gradually throughout the rest of the term, we will relax these assumptions one by one. So the first assumption of the Druda model is that electrons are classical. All right, so we're not gonna assume anything about quantum physics as we study the Druda model. The second assumption of the Druda model is that the ions, these are the atoms with the core electrons, are fixed, and that the electrons collide with the ions. We're also going to assume that these collisions occur with probability 
per unit time of one over tau. So tau will be called variously the collision time or the relaxation time in the Druda model. Um, the Druda model does not tell us where this collision time tau comes from. It doesn't explain why it exists, but uh, we must invoke a collision time like this, you'll see, to explain uh, dissipation in materials. Um, you'll see that on average, each electron travels a time tau uh, uh, before its next collision. And if I pick one electron out at random from uh, the entire collection of electrons in metal, it will uh, have traveled a time on average tau since its last uh, collision. All right, so again, we need to invoke this collision time tau. The Druda model doesn't tell us or explain where this tau comes from. So the next assumption of the Druda model is that the electrons are independent. Uh, this means that the electrons do not interact with each other. Okay, obviously they do, they're charged, uh, but just yet, or, or just for now, we will assume that the electrons do not interact with each other. Later on, we will relax this assumption. We will assume that the electrons are free. This means that they don't interact with the ions, except uh, during these collisions. And the last assumption is that the electrons reach thermal equilibrium via this process of collisions. Moreover, these collisions are completely inelastic. Uh, and the velocity of an electron emerging from a collision is completely uncorrelated with whatever the velocity was uh, before the collision. So now you can see um, if you like, how the electrons reach thermal equilibrium. And we assume that the average velocity of an electron emerging from a collision is given by uh, whatever thermal equilibrium value we expect there to be. So um, the picture that one should have of electrons moving now in a lattice of ions in the Druda model is the following. So let me draw a picture of a lattice of ions. Now let's suppose I have an electron coming in here. It hits a lot, an ion, it collides, it emerges from this collision in a completely random direction with a velocity that is uncorrelated with the velocity before. Okay, now it's traveling down, it reaches this ion, it emerges again in a random direction with a random velocity. It might go here, backward after this collision. The next one might go all the way over here then it might go back like this. So this is kind of the picture you wanna have for electrons scattering off of ions and colliding in, in the Druda model. So um, the Druda model will give us Ohm's law. So you remember that Ohm's law is the relationship between the voltage and current in a circuit and the proportionality, the constant proportionality between the current and the voltage is the resistance of the material R. So often it's handy to think about the resistance of some object uh, as the resistivity of the material times some geometric factors. Um, if we have a rectangular object, the resistance is equal to the resistivity rho times the length of that object divided by the area. So sometimes during this course, I'll use the same symbol to mean different things. So here I'm using rho to mean the resistivity of the material. Previously, I used it to use mass density. I hope in most cases you'll understand what I mean. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you are confused. So let's imagine I have a rectangular block of material. Here it is. Uh, 
um, here's cross-sectional area A, and it has length L. Now, uh, let's suppose that I apply the voltage between the two ends of this uh, object. Now I expect uh, a current to flow. This current is carried by electrons moving at some speed uh, V. And during a very short time dt, the electrons will have moved a distance V dt. And in doing so, if you like, they will have all of the electrons in this block will have swept out uh, a small volume of, of this material. So uh, let's talk about something called the current density. So uh, let me just give you a little bit of perspective here before we dive too deeply into this. So we're going to derive Ohm's law um, uh, in the context of the Druda model. Uh, we will derive the resistivity or equivalently the conductivity of the material in terms of this uh, relaxation time uh, tau. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time setting up uh, the terminology here. We'll talk about uh, resistivity. We're now going to talk about current densities, but in just a few minutes, we will derive the resistivity uh, of, of a material in terms of uh, various parameters like the density, uh, the effective mass of the electrons and uh, this relaxation time tau. So keep that in mind uh, just as we set up some, some terminology here. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the current density. So if I uh, think about this small volume that the electrons have swept out in some time dt, uh, the total charge in that volume dq is equal to minus uh, E, that's the charge of electrons times the density of electrons in this material, that's a constant that depends on the material, times now the volume of this uh, small shape, which is V, the velocity of the electrons, dt, this short time, and the cross-sectional area A. All right, so the current, I, is dq over dt, is minus E times the density times the speed of the electrons times the cross-sectional area A. So let's define the current density little j, which is equal to the current uh, divided by the cross-sectional area. That is equal to minus E times the density times the speed of the electrons uh, V. All right, so we'll use this notion of a current density here and uh, at some later points in the course. Now, the next thing we have to ask ourselves, remember we're calculating the resistivity in the framework of the Druda model, is what happens to uh, the electrons in the presence of an electric field? Well, remember that on average, if I pick an electron out from a metal, on average, it will have traveled a time tau since its last collision. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that suppose there is an electric field E. That means that an electron will have acquired, now as a result of this electric field, uh, a velocity uh, proportional to this electric field and uh, this time that it has traveled unimpeded tau. So 
minus E, the charge of the electron times the electric field, E, now it's a vector, times this relaxation time tau over M. So let me add a vector symbol to this electric field. Um, again, this is just expressing Newton's second law for the electron here. Um, the total uh, acceleration of the electron in the presence of the electric field E is minus E, E over M. And uh, the electron we're assuming has accelerated on average a time tau since its last collision. Uh, that means that the average velocity then of all of these electrons in the presence of an electric field E is minus E, E tau over M. Now, uh, you could ask, uh, well, what about the velocity of the electron before its collision? Shouldn't that have an effect on the average velocity of all the electrons? Uh, in fact, no. So um, uh, let's suppose that um, at any given time, an electron has velocity v, which will be equal to minus e, e tau over m. This is the velocity, this is the change in velocity, if you like, since the last collision of the electron. Let's now add the velocity that the electron had when it emerged from the collision. So we're supposing that a time tau in the past, an electron collided with an ion. It immediately emerged from that collision with speed v naught. Um, a time tau later, it has speed minus e, e tau over m plus v naught. Um, if I now average over all electrons to find uh -oh. to find the velocity. You see that I get just the same thing because the average over all electrons of V naught, uh, this random velocity that each electron has after it emerges from a collision is zero. Uh, because for example, the electrons don't have any preferred direction to emerge from a collision. And so um, if you like this average of the vector quantity just goes to zero because the direction an electron has as it emerges from a collision uh, is completely isotropic. Okay, so I've now written down uh, the average velocity of a set of electrons in an electric field E. Uh, we've written it in terms of this collision time tau. Well, now, if you just look back at our previous equation for J, which is minus NEV, if I make this a vector quantity, and if I use for the velocity the the average velocity that we just calculated in the Druda model, you can see that the current density J is equal to n e squared e tau over m. All right, so let's recap the state of affairs right now. We just showed that the current density J is equal to n e squared times the electric field E times the relaxation time tau over m. We've shown that the current density that occurs in response to an electric field E is actually linearly proportional to that field E. So the proportion, constant of proportionality is n e squared tau over m. Let's define conductivity sigma, which is n e squared tau over m. So you see that the current density that uh, occurs in response to an electric field is proportional to that electric field and the constant of proportionality is something that we'll call the conductivity. In the Druder model, it's equal to n e squared tau over m. Again, tau is the, the Druder relaxation time. Remember that the conductivity of a material is equal to the inverse of the resistivity rho. Um, this statement now, j equals sigma e, is equivalent to Ohm's law uh, to see how this can reduce to the familiar form of Ohm's law. Let's imagine that we are considering a long rectangular bar of material with cross-sectional area A, length L, 
And let's suppose we've applied a voltage V between the two ends of the bar and current flows along the length of the bar in response to this voltage. Now, uh, let me multiply both sides of this equation, J equals sigma E by the cross-sectional area A. Let me also notice that uh, the electric field across the bar, uh, again, if this is a very long bar, is equal to um, the voltage we've applied across the bar divided by its length. Now, uh, I'm going to, so I've dropped the vector notation in, uh, in this last equation. So let me just uh, uh, indicate that the total current flowing through the bar is equal to the current density J times A, um, like this. So now we have I is equal to sigma A V over L. Now, sigma is just one over rho. Now remember from our earlier discussion that uh, if we have a material with resistivity rho, rho times, what's going on here? Rho times L over A is just equal to the resistance of the bar. So you see that I is equal to one over R times V, or if you like, V is equal to IR. This is the familiar form of Ohm's law. So you see that J equals sigma E, is exactly equivalent to Ohm's law. So we've derived Ohm's law in, uh, in the framework of, of the Druda model. All right. Um, so what else can we say? Um, typical values of the relaxation time tau in metals are of order 10 to the minus 14 uh, to 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, typically, this is extracted uh, via measurements of the conductivity and density in the metal. In other words, if you know the conductivity and uh, the density, you can extract an effective relaxation time. Uh, another important parameter that we often use to describe uh, systems in the framework of the Druid model, especially two-dimensional systems, is the mobility mu, which is defined as the average velocity divided by uh, the electric field. The magnitude of the average velocity divided by the magnitude of the electric field. You can see that this is equal to uh, N E. Uh, rather, you can see that uh, the conductivity, let me get my eraser here, you can see that the conductivity is equal to N E mu. Um, so uh, if you like mu, contains the information about the relaxation time, uh, while the conductivity contains information about both the conductivity, excuse me, both the density and, uh, and, and relaxation time. Um, let's define one other piece of terminology, which is the mean free path. This will be the distance that each electron travels on average before it collides with another ion, so L will be equal to the average velocity times this collision time tau. Now, let's ask, what is the mean free path of an electron in thermal equilibrium uh, without any applied electric field in a material? So one thing we could do to estimate um, the, the average velocity, uh, let's say the average speed, uh, not the velocity, which is a vector quantity, but the average speed, is to say, well, if we're considering that these electrons are members of a classical gas of particles, maybe we can just use equipartition to estimate uh, the average kinetic energy of the electrons. And in so doing, we could estimate the average square velocity of the electron. So I'm imagining, let's say that a half m times the average velocity squared is equal to 3 halves kBT. 3 halves because we're in three dimensions. Uh, it's perfectly fine to have a non-zero mean square velocity 
mean square average velocity. Remember the, the mean average velocity is zero, it's a vector quantity, but the mean square average velocity, which is just a scalar, need not be zero. If, again, if we're thinking about these electrons as members of a classical gas, it seems perfectly valid to think about uh, a half mv squared as being equal to three halves kbt. Um, so if I plug in uh, room temperature for T here and the mass m of the electron, I get something on the order of 10 to the five uh, meters per second. Uh, if I wanna be uh, correct in CGS units, this is 10 to the seven centimeters per second. Uh, then if I use the previous estimate of the relaxation time tau, 10 to the minus 14 or 10 to the minus 15 seconds, we find that typical values we would guess for the mean free path are of order uh, 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus nine meters, which is 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus seven centimeters. Now in the face of it, this might make sense, right? 10 to the minus 10 meters is the typical size of an atom, uh, typical spacing between atoms. So it's not so hard to imagine that the mean free path of an electron might actually be this value. Uh, Turns out though, that this is not the case actually. Uh, so especially at very low temperatures and in very clean systems, uh, mean free paths can be of order uh, 10 to the minus six meters or larger. So, Already, you can see that something about the Judah model is, uh, is, is a little bit uh, funny. Um, maybe the first thing to note is that it's not actually the ions themselves that lead to these collisions in solids. Remember our naive picture of collisions in solids was that the electrons are zipping along their merry way and they collide with the ions. Uh, that can't really be the case if mean free paths can be of order 10 to the minus six meters uh, or so. Uh, so we'll have to wait until much later in the course to find the resolution to this. It turns out that, that lattice vibrations, phonons, are in fact responsible for collisions. Tau. It's not the ions themselves, it's the phonons, the vibrations of the lattice. Uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, let's forge ahead. And um, again, we're just going to assume the presence of this collision time tau. Uh, and see if we can make some predictions which are uh, agnostic to the actual value of tau. So um, the last thing we need to do when we're setting up the basics of the Druda model is to derive the equation of motion for electrons in the Druda model. Uh, so remember that the current density J is minus NEV. This is equal to minus n e times momentum of the electrons divided by their mass. And when we write down an equation of motion, we're going to imagine that the momentum and current density can be time dependent. So let's write down an equation of motion for P, the momentum of the electrons. So let's ask, can we write down what is the momentum of an electron at some time t plus dt. So here t is some time, dt is a small increment of time. Uh, can we write down what the momentum is uh, a little bit later in time, given the momentum at time t plus some knowledge of an external force acting on the electrons. Here I'm calling it f of t and how that force acted over this short time interval, dt. All right, well, so, so naively, right, you'd imagine that uh, during this short time interval, dt, the momentum will change from p of t to p of t plus, uh, f of t dt, right? This is the impulse associated with this force f over this short, short time interval dt. Uh, 
Uh, that's true unless the electron undergoes a collision during this short time. So to accurately predict the momentum at some later time t plus dt, based on the momentum at some time t and knowledge of the force f of t, we have to add the impulse to the momentum at time t, but we have to take into account the fact that only a fraction of electrons do not collide with the ions during this time dt. So remember that the electrons col uh, collide with ions with a probability per unit time of one over tau. So the probability that the electrons do not collide is one minus dt over tau. So dt over tau, this is the fraction of the electrons that do collide in this time dt. So one minus dt over tau is a fraction of electrons that, that don't collide. This is the fraction of electrons uh, whose momentum changes according to the impulse delivered by, uh, uh, delivered by the force F. Of course, we're imagining times dt substantially less than the collision time tau. All right, so now let's just expand out uh, uh, the terms here on the right-hand side. So this is equal to P of T minus DT over tau P of T. Let me make sure my vector signs are all where they need to be, plus F of T DT. The rest of the terms are of order DT squared. They're very small, so we can neglect them. Uh, if you're curious about what happens to the, the fraction of electrons uh, that did collide, right, this equation so far is only considering those electrons that didn't collide. If we want to include the electrons that did collide, that will give us terms of order dt squared or higher. So we also don't need to include these. So now uh, by bringing uh, uh, the terms with p of t and p of t plus dt to the same side of the equation and by dividing through by dt, now you can see that dp dt is equal to minus p of t over tau plus f of t. So this is the equation of motion for electrons in the Druda model. Um, and this is what we will use uh, to compute the behavior of electrons in the presence of magnetic fields. That's the subject of our next mini lecture on the Hall effect.